Hello and welcome to the Smarter Tech Podcast. My name is Nick, the EMF guy, you know, I'm the host of this podcast, quite obviously, the author of <laughs> the non tinfoil guide to EMFs. Uh, I also have a couple of courses. This interview is special, and this is why I'm doing a video intro if you're listening to the video version. We're talking about COVID. Oops. Is it going to get banned? Is it going to get censored? I don't know. So we're talking about the pandemic and how um, electropollution, including 5G, I'm just waiting to see if the video disappears, including 5G is impacted by that electropollution. Electropollution is an environmental toxin. I think that I've established that in the last five years I've been doing this and the work of scientists, of course, I'm just reporting on their job. But so environmental toxin and how it impacts us. And can it have an impact on our ability to withstand respiratory viruses, infections, stuff that your immune system needs to fight? Nothing crazy or controversial about it. And yet I'm here <laughs> kind of being fearful of being canceled as a result. So anyway, we're diving into that discussion but the scientific standpoint, as I'm inter interviewing Dr. Beverly Rubik, she has a PhD in uh, biophysics and uh, has a, quite an extensive background. Uh, let's, let me read her official bio and you'll understand really that we're talking with someone at uh, the top of frontier science here. Dr. Beverly Rubik has had a lifelong interest in frontier areas of science and medicine that go beyond the mainstream. And she is internationally renowned for her pioneering research, especially on the human energy field and energy medicine. She earned her PhD in biophysics at the University of California at Berkeley, has published over 90 peer-reviewed papers and two books. In 1996, she founded the Institute for Frontier Science, IFS, that's a 501c3 nonprofit research laboratory now in Emeryville, uh, CA. Presently, she is conducting research on the adverse health effects of wireless radiation on health, among other topics. We're going to talk about the pandemic a little bit. Uh, Dr. Rubik is going to make comments on the vaccine. That's her comments. I don't personally comment on the vaccine technology that much. I've decided to stay focused on EMFs. If you want my thoughts, you can probably contact me personally, but I normally it's not a topic I've decided to make my battle. I'm sticking with EMFs and that's well enough. So there's that. We're going to talk about the pandemic, uh, a little bit about vaccine because we do talk about the different solutions for the pandemic. What, what could, could we have done? One of them is minimizing exposure to EMFs from cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, magnetic fields, electric fields, dirty electricity, everything that I talk about in my courses and books, how reducing that agent might lead to a more functioning or um, normally functioning immune response when exposed to any agent, bacteria, virus, stressor, job loss, spouse dispute. I don't know. Are you better, better able to handle life if you minimize your EMF exposure? We're going to also talk about the human biofield. What is it? And is the biofield that can be scientifically measured uh, in different ways? And Dr. Rubik is going to talk about this briefly. Um, is it impacted by EMF pollution? That's another topic that I really never touched in my life. So, and we're going to also uh, add another layer in there. Um, how does science, how did it evolve in the wrong direction, if you ask me? But I'm going to ask Dr. Rubik also, how did it evolve during the pandemic? And what does it mean for you as someone trying to make sense of this world and of the science? So we talk about censorship. We talk about the realities of being independent from big business as a scientist, what does it mean to be at the frontier science? Um, trying to do real legit science for topics such as the biofield or even EMFs, topics that have been 
pushed aside because they're unpopular or because they go against certain industries or because um, they go against uh, some dogma that people have that the biofield is not serious or that this is uh, somehow um, not something that is real. So anyway, diving into the interview now, I want to preface just saying, if you have a comment, if you don't agree with the discussion, keep it civil. And you can uh, agree or disagree on the vaccines and the pandemic and the measures and EMFs, the biofield, Dr. Rubik's work, my work, but just write it in the comment. Let's have a discussion. So I hope that everyone listening to this will be uh, smart enough to show us their intelligence when they comment and be constructive, constructive in their comments. Uh, both positive or negative, and stay constructive in their criticism. So I hope that you like this episode. This is a very, very exciting interview for me. And I hope that Dr. Rubik will be back on the show a little bit later, later this year. So without further ado, sorry for the long drawn out intro. Let's dive into the interview. Hello and welcome to the Smarter Tech Podcast. Today, I have the honor of talking with Dr. Beverly Rubik, who's a scientist, um, PhD in biophysics, and an internationally renowned expert around the human biofield and beyond. I have to mention, I looked at your website, what you've uh, talked about when it comes to water structure and so many topics that are at the very, uh, very edge of frontier science. And I think what is um, probably 50 years ahead of your time, to be honest. I'm so honored to have you here, uh, Dr. Rubik. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nick. It's my pleasure. Awesome. And you, you published a paper. We're going to dive right into it. Uh, what I'm going to uh, say at the beginning is a lot of speculation has happened at the be beginning of the pandemic of the virus we all know about. I don't even know if this is going to pass on YouTube, but worst case scenario, this is going to be on BitChute. Who knows? So a lot of people have made that link between 5G and the rollout of 5G and the virus at first. And I saw this um, almost uh, this new joke that I hear from the mainstream now, oh, the 5G chip. And it's, it's almost a joke now that, oh, 5G is a, it's like a, a running gag of how ridiculous this link is. But Scientists, you and Dr. Havis and other scientists probably have talked about the link between um, respiratory viruses, the immune system, many bodily systems that are affected by electropollution, and also 5G that is part of electropollution. So in fact, when I looked at it being ridiculed, I was like, well, I don't understand why it is being ridiculed because it is a link that needs to be looked at. And we need to, to know if someone who lives in a city under a cell tower is more at risk from a respiratory virus, because then we can do something about policy. And it's just logic. So please let us know first about your credentials, maybe a little bit of background. And then what is this paper you've published in, uh, if I recall correctly, September of 2021 about, um, and that is completely fascinating. And I, th that I think offers the the best rationale that is scientific about the 5g uh covid link or for all respiratory viruses well first of all uh, my background is in biophysics i completed my doctorate in biophysics uh, over 40 years ago at the university of california at berkeley and i've been operating my own independent laboratory a nonprofit lab since 1997 uh, here in California. I've also served uh, as a professor at several universities, uh, but because my questions have been uh, something other than mainstream, uh, what I call frontier science, uh, a yeah. little bit outside of the official paradigm of science, uh, I found a need to really start my own laboratory to take this outside of the university because there was a lot of prejudice and difficulty in operating mm -hmm. in the university with the kind of questions I was asking about things like uh, the energy field of the human, alternative medicine, and more, more recently, the influence of uh, electropollution, especially wireless, uh, on our health. And then the most recent paper that I wrote was uh, 
well, because I had done some previous research back in 2014, looking at the influence on blood of simply wearing a cell phone in a backpack or using a cell phone for 45 minutes. And I found some adverse changes in the blood that actually were early stages of clotting. And as I learned about COVID-19, I recognized that it wasn't just an ordinary respiratory virus, but it had this element of clotting. That was actually one of the most dangerous aspects when cytokine storms and uh, oxidative stress damage led to clots within vessels, within major organs. It could lead to death or dysfunction of those organs. So I scratched my head and said, maybe there's some relationship here. And I'm going to take a hard look at the literature on COVID-19 and also review the literature uh, on 5G, which was um, actually pretty scant, but nonetheless involves the densification of 4G antennas mm -hmm. and infrastructure. So uh, we had that going on. Uh, at the same time, this thing appeared and Wuhan, China, was one of China's model cities where 5G had been completely implemented. I believe it was October 31st, 2019. And then, of course, just a couple of months later, this pandemic appeared, apparently starting in Wuhan. And then we looked around the world and said, where, where is this thing going? And interestingly, it was going to the places where 5G had already been partly rolled out, namely Northern Italy, New York City, Seattle, Silicon Valley, uh, South Korea, and a handful of other places. There was definitely a correspondence and a paper uh, published showing a statistical significance of that correspondence of early pandemic spreading throughout the world and the presence of 5G, or at least partial uh, installation of 5G wireless infrastructure. So yeah. my paper was about looking at the, the um, correspondence of the symptomatology from wireless and the pathophysiology of COVID-19. In other words, the symptoms uh, and the progression of COVID-19. And we saw about five areas of correspondence, one of them being the blood, which is very unusual because I don't know another virus that causes rampant clotting throughout the body. And what, is, what did we see in our paper and also Magda Havas saw back in 2013 was early stages of clotting. I'm not the only one who's seen this. Lots of people who look under microscopes have seen the sticking together of red blood cells in formations such as rouleau, which is the French word for uh, a stack or a roll, like a stack of coins and other aggregations of red blood cells. And that's, those are the early stages of clotting. Red blood cells come together, they're sticky, and fibrin forms, and then uh, circulation can't happen. That's a clot. And so that's very much a part of what happens with exposure to wireless within our own blood, just after a few minutes. For example, I expose people more recently, not in that paper, but to about one milliwatt per square centimeter, which is the uh, around the ceiling of exposure in the United States uh, to wireless. I exposed them for just 10 minutes to a wireless 4G router and then looked at the blood. And in 12 out of 12 people seen repeatedly on different occasions, I see these changes in the blood of sticky red blood cells and early clotting. So there it is. And I was looking at age 40 to 80. The middle-aged and elderly seem to show the greatest effects in this regard. And also in COVID, we noticed that it was not a young people's disease. It was a middle-aged and elderly disease as well, mm -hmm. especially when it was serious and involved blood clots. So that's the essence of my paper. It's about um, changes in the blood, but there are five or six other changes that we can talk about as well. Yeah. And... Do you think that the 5G and virus link has been exaggerated in some media? I saw it uh, a little bit blown out of proportion. And I remember I did write 
articles uh, about the pandemic and some some of my colleagues or even uh, people reading my newsletters did not like that because there was this topic that was untouchable but i was reporting on what i understood was the mortality rate and uh, does the masking work and all sorts of questions that are a bit outside of my usual work as someone who usually talks EMFs and tries to have discussion with scientists such as yourself or building biologists. But still, I was trying to make sense of this craziness that was happening. But I saw the 5G link. Some people were saying, well, the, the antennas are causing the virus and these kind of simplistic conclusions that were being thrown out, even on alternative media. Do you agree with that? And how, how did you, uh, what's your conclusion about, about how, well, how that link should have been represented? Well, we did even see some press on our own paper that exaggerated our results because we're hypothesizing a relationship. We're not saying, hey, there is a relationship. Yeah. And we're, we're suggesting that the evidence points to this, but it isn't conclusive. But some people ran off with it mm -hmm. um, and we couldn't control it. And they didn't even interview us. They just went on their own and made videos and wrote little articles saying this paper proves causation and it has 145 references. <laughs> Therefore, uh, there it is. Yeah. But um, they didn't read it very carefully, sadly. But the point is, even in, in standard epidemiology and, and the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, right on their website, it says there's an epidemiological triangle that all diseases have three factors. One is an agent like a virus. The other is the health of the host. And the third is the environment. But nobody's been talking about the environment in a sensible way. That's true. Um, until a few papers appeared talking about statistical correlations and then our paper. Uh, and I, you know, here it is two, over two years after this pandemic has began. And all we can hear is the official word from the World Health Organization, the CDC and like organizations. They do not allow discussion or open ended science, which of course science really is. Science is never a closed system. They say they're in charge of dishing out the official word. And yet we have not controlled this pandemic. Uh, after two years of their, uh, shall we say, their attempt to do that. So it's time, a, a long time already, to have an open-ended discussion on science and not be stuck in the scientism of a singular view that was promulgated by the official agencies. And so that makes me very sad that there's been a lot of censorship of the official science. There are many people like myself also looking at these questions of epidemiology, perhaps the role of air pollution. Yeah. Uh, for example, in China, it's a realistic thing. There's a lot of air pollution which can contribute to respiratory illness, but somehow that's not permitted either. So, so it's really crazy. We really need an open-ended discussion already of all of the factors involved and how we can finally overcome this pandemic, which is ruining the world economically, socially, and impacting it in ways that we couldn't have imagined. Uh, two years ago, we were told, all we need to do is go on a lockdown for a few weeks to flatten the curve. Well, so much for that. Two years later, people are still wearing uh, masks, some cases they're still in lockdowns or partial lockdowns and um, it's all about a vaccine and not about multiple ways of handling a pandemic which it should be because a pandemic has multiple causes and should have multiple approaches yeah i i agree with you 110 percent and i've been a little bit more silent on the pandemic in the last year trying to focus on my work on ems but the reality is i've been reading a lot about uh, the link with between uh, obesity and COVID-19 risk, uh, low vitamin D levels and COVID-19 risk. So things have, have been clarified on certain topics. And I think the 
the evidence on vitamin D is overwhelming, completely overwhelming that supplementation uh, could help, or at least, I mean, sun exposure first, but if not, supplementation could also help bring um, the blood levels up. But these discussions at the beginning were censored. I remember vitamin D, uh, the FDA saying anyone discussing vitamin D will be fired if you're a doctor. I'm like, what What are you talking about? Vitamin D uh, with, with a safety profile that's almost... Uh, it's, that's incredibly safe. You cannot really overdose on it. So anyway, I was very surprised and very shocked in the last two years about the, the level of censorship. And, and then, of course, it's as if, as if the, the world has stopped thinking uh, or, or the, this, the scientists have been crushed by this, this group think. And unfortunately, the 5G um, electropollution discussion has been lumped with it and very, very demonized in, uh, in, in many uh, mainstream media. And I remember a lot of uh, people uh, that are Hollywood um, famous, like John Cusack or DJs, or I, I don't remember all the names, but many people who have millions of followers on Instagram, some of them, of them uh, read about the 5G link. And maybe it was from a video that was incorrect, but overall, some of them had a message that was very decent and said, well, I don't think the cell towers are good for us. They got, they had to backtrack their statements after that. So that's crazy because we do know that the cell towers are not good for us. The science is overwhelmingly clear, but at the same time, I think the pressure from the telecoms and, and also the group think in North America is, is, has kind of become stronger during this pandemic years. So did you get backlash to the publication of your paper, either among your peers or did, the, did you get that level of censorship? Um, uh, towards your work? Well, initially we had a lot of trouble even posting an earlier version of this paper on what's mm. called a preprint server. And normally a preprint server is not doing any peer review. Yeah. I had rejections from three of them, much to my amazement, wow. when all kinds of papers on COVID were going up in preprint servers because people wanted to get the word out early on. And so finally I found one where it, it went up and it didn't seem to be monitored. Um, but then we had rejections by several journals just based on the topic. Yeah. It had nothing to do with uh, any details in the paper. Uh, the title of the paper or just a few sentences of the abstract says we can't handle this. Uh, and, and you know, journals are largely controlled by big pharma, mm -hmm. uh, sadly. Uh, increasingly, I would say we see big pharmaceutical companies are controlling medicine. And that's certainly what we have today in terms of uh, this enormous push for injections, which I won't call a vaccine uh, because they're not really vaccines, but um, gene therapy, modification of genes based on use of messenger RNA that codes for a spike protein, which we know now is one of the most toxic aspects of this virus that in fact causes a lot of the problems from the blood changes to immune system disruptions to uh, cardiac effects. Um, there it is. And people, people's bodies are turned into literally a factory for making this spike protein upon injection. And so that very much concerns me where how big pharmaceutical companies have taken over medicine, controlling what appears in journals, controlling um, the FDA in terms of uh, use of vitamin D3 and other supplements. There was another supplement that was recommended and that's an acetylcysteine, which is one of the important precursors of glutathione, the major antioxidant, which by the way is depressed upon exposure to wireless radiation, but it's also depressed in COVID-19. And the outcome of, of COVID is very much linked to your levels of glutathione. It was shown um, in numerable studies that if you have a very low glutathione, you may not make it. With COVID-19, you may succumb to this disease. And so NAC was then being touted by holistic health uh, practitioners as a potential solution to boost your levels of glutathione and possibly reduce the seriousness of COVID-19. 
And again, the FDA moved quickly and has been trying to take NAC, the supplement, off the market. And you can't find it easily anymore, except maybe among practitioner supplements. So that's another um, move that we've seen that is reducing people's options uh, for helping themselves with simple things like diet, nutrition, and supplementation. Yeah, I agree 100%. And it reminds me of a discussion between two scientists, uh, Chris Masterson and uh, Brett Weinstein from the Dark Horse podcast. And they were talking about the fact that it looks like health agencies like the FDA have done things so backward during the pandemic, including banning information about vitamin D and recommending practices that uh, like lockdown that in the end were... <sighs> Did, did not really contribute to anything, but were very destructive. So they, they've done things so backward that it looks like they're trying to screw things up. And, and that's when I heard that from scientists that were otherwise two years ago, extremely conservative about what they were saying and concluding. I don't know. I, I just feel like everything, the, the, if, if you want to know the truth about what, what's been happening, you got to follow, I think, scientists and doctors directly and, and for, almost forego the official narrative altogether, which is, I'm, I'm very saddened to say that because I wanted to keep personally a little bit of faith in, in authorities say, well, maybe they don't, don't really know what they're doing or they're trying to figure it out and science is evolving, but it's been so backward. And, and as you said, these links can be made and, and the precautionary principle is important to apply here. If you're in the, in the middle of a pandemic and you have NAC or vitamin D with safety profiles that are very interesting, what is the harm of telling people to try it? Uh, I don't understand. Uh, it's not like saying, oh, you should uh, start taking certain pharmaceutical drugs um, without the consent of your doctor. And it's, it's, it's very, very different from doing that or telling people, for example, look, there's a pandemic going on. Uh, let's take that time to, I mean, maybe stay home if the stay home hoarders are here, but exercise and eat well and meditate and take care of your immune health. But almost that, the, even that message, that message that you can have a stronger immune system through using certain means that are mostly free or, or that are just common sense is even, even that is controversial nowadays. <laughs> Yes, it is. And you have to say, there seems to be a larger agenda. And it's not really about our health, fundamentally. In this case, it seemed to be about injections. I never in my life before saw such a push for these injections. Coercion. And you didn't know what's in them. I mean, they don't tell you. And there's trade secrets. And uh, we still don't understand, really, what's in these things. We cannot practice informed consent. And that's one of the most important things in terms of what's being injected in our bodies that you know bypass the liver and all of the detoxification measures and just go directly to all our major organs. It's a huge thing. And if people can't perform informed consent, what kind of world are we living in, in terms mm -hmm. of what's being in directly injected in our bodies? We have to ask that question. I think. Um, and we have to be concerned about 5G. It's being touted as bigger, faster internet. And wow, the internet of things where everything you own is being going to be connected. Yeah. Why? Why do I need this? It's more about machine to machine talk, um, self-driving cars and a few other things that I'm not sure I really need fundamentally. But I'm more concerned about my benefit risk ratio. And we're not talking about those things. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about modifying our planet with 50,000 or more satellites emitting these wireless frequencies, plus millions of antennas being installed close to our homes, our schools, and our business places, blasting the world with wireless with frequencies and pulsation modes that have never before been tried with living systems. We can point to a literature, Nick, on 
4G and 5G, but we don't really know what real world 5G devices will do to us, yeah. especially when this large scale infrastructure is implemented. We didn't even have an, an environmental impact statement. And there are laws on the books, at least in the United States, that when you make a drastic change like this, you have to have an environmental impact review. Where is that review? Senator Blumenthal had a meeting with uh, a small group in the Senate in 2019, including the telecom industry. And he asked the question, what health and safety studies have you done? And they said, absolutely none. We're riding on the FCC's guidelines, yeah. the Federal Communication Commission, which regulates wireless um, frequency bands and levels in the United States. And those guidelines go back to 1996. They haven't even looked at the literature for the past 25 years to say what's going on. And it's sim simply not enough to say uh, the, the guidelines of FCC are so and we can abide by them. That may be legally so, but it doesn't make any sense when it comes to health and wellness of the whole biosphere, not just humanity. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. And I want to backtrack a second just to clarify my position on the vaccines. I know some people listening to this will be. I don't want to say horrified, I guess horrified. Some people are horrified when you say, oh, the vaccines don't work or um, I don't like that new technology. It's almost like, oh, better retro. You cannot talk about it. People who come on my show or are featured, you're you're completely free of talking your mind about any of these things. And if people in the comments think otherwise, they can they can write so. And I'm happy that they don't disagree and they say, oh no, it's been protective to the elderly or it's been protective to everyone. Or I think we should vaccinate all the babies. Okay, well, at least we can have a discussion about it. What I did not like is the lack of discussion and the censorship. And the second thing you mentioned, which is completely correct, is the literally the destruction of informed consent. And in, in Quebec here, uh, we've been one of the worst places where, oh, if it, oh, that's okay, Nick, you can choose to get vaccinated or not. But if you don't, we're gonna make sure that you cannot go to the movies, you cannot do this, do that, have a, a, a date with your wife, and you certainly cannot go out of the country. So is that really informed consent? No, it's it's forced extortion. So anyone who still thinks that informed consent was used in the scope of this vaccination, I think they're completely blinded by something that I don't understand. So that's one I wanted to clarify. I want to go back to your paper, though, because, again, if you have a pandemic or anything else happening to the population and you realize that in cities you have people with poor responses to respiratory viruses. There are different agents at play that could explain it, like air pollution, but also electrosmog. And you did mention, uh, that's something Dr. Havis also mentioned several times, that electropollution, including 5G, or likely including 5G, uh, will reduce uh, the, let's say, the abilities of our immune system. Is, is that correct? That basically it will suppress our immune system when we're ex exposed to unabated exposures like these? Well, it can be immunosuppressive and it depends upon the frequencies, the bands, the modulations, the polarizations, all okay. these wave parameters. So immune system dysfunction is how we wrote it in the paper. On the one hand, we sometimes see immunosuppression, but it also can cause uh, an exacerbation of the immune system okay. toward autoimmunity and mm. hyperinflammation. Some of the aspects of COVID-19, such as the cytokine storm in the most severe cases, which can lead to death or organ failure and destroy tissues within us. Um, T lymphocytes generally have gone down. This is the important lymphocyte for our immune system that also went down in HIV and AIDS. And both wireless exposure, 4G, 5G, and COVID-19 suppress the T lymphocytes. And so then um, you can have this hyperinflammation and attack on our own tissues. 
I understand. And you also talked about um, the fact that it worsens or can worsen heart arrhythmias and cardiac disorders. Uh, there's two different uh, cardiologists, uh, Dr. Stephen Sinatra and also Dr. Wolfson uh, that has been featured on my recent summit who did the, um, basically saw patients with heart dysfunction that was directly linked to having a phone in the shirt pocket. So that was, let's say, an extreme example where one thing leads to one symptom, let's say, to put it quite uh, simplistically. But you also talked in your paper about the fact that it, it, it looks like exposure to all, sorts, all, all environmental EMFs can worsen the heart arrhythmias and that in COVID-19, it's also a big reason of why people can have a deadly version of COVID-19 is through blood clots and heart uh, complications, if I recall correctly. Yes. Well, I myself uh, experienced arrhythmias. When uh, you buy a new desktop computer and it comes with a wireless mouse and a wireless mm -hmm. keyboard, I don't even know why you need all of that in a desktop computer yeah. where it's stationary. But um, working for hours in front of this new desktop computer, I started to get heart palpitations, which is a Rene arrhythmia. And then it occurred to me, but the only wireless in my home is really this new computer, the parts, because I'm totally wired aside from a cell phone and replacing them with wired keyboard and wired mouse, my symptoms went away. Other people I know who had similar things went on to get pacemakers installed. No, no physician knows much about this. They don't ask about your exposure to wireless and how it may be influencing things like atrial fibrillation, a very common arrhythmia of the elderly, which is getting worse and worse. It's, we're seeing more and more cases. Myself, I have some clients who have had these problems and they've taken it upon themselves with my guidance to reduce the wireless exposure in their homes with wired appliances, wired mouse, keyboard, et cetera, and using their cell phone in a wired way. And guess what? Their atrial fibrillation also went away. So what is perceived as organic by some may be a simple functional disorder related to really too much wireless. And the more we get exposed to these things and the more antennas and devices around us that are going to be blasting us with wireless really concerns me because we're going to see more and more uh, electrosensitivity of which I would say the heart arrhythmias is just one example. There are so many other symptoms like concentration difficulties, insomnia, uh, poor memory, headaches, uh, there's a slew of symptoms. And another interesting thing is that those symptoms of electrosensitivity also look like the symptoms of what is called long COVID. Mm. Long COVID being the chronic version that people are left with who after they heal up from the acute version, they sometimes have long-term symptoms. And some of those symptoms completely overlap with um, the same symptoms of wireless exposure of electrosensitivity. Yeah. Something else to think about. Yeah, for sure. And with long COVID, I, I think the, the literature, even after two years, isn't so clear. When I hear some of the doctors I, I like and trust about the topic, it's still very unclear if we're only seeing, I think, uh, just even more people being sick uh, and have chronic disease. Before the pandemic, it was bad enough to the point that uh, chronic disease was on the rise and many chronic diseases were on the rise. Uh, I, I don't know, three or fourfold increase in the last 50 years or more. So, and it was pre-COVID. So how many people are attributing it, attributing their conditions or kind of blaming their condition on, uh, oh, that was after after COVID, I started getting that, or is it also um, just situational where they have developed autoimmunity, or maybe having a virus like that and, and a harsh version of the infection led to, let's say, uh, an autoimmune condition that now becomes symptomatic, whereas previously it was basically under the hood and very silent. Yes, and keep in mind that during the lockdowns and the isolation that we've suffered with 
for almost two years now with COVID-19, people are more and more exposed to wireless. They're using That's true. their wireless devices to communicate more, to go on Zoom, to use the cell phone, texting, et cetera. So we have more exposure than ever before that Gosh. could be contributing to yeah. uh, what we call long COVID. Yes, and our, I cannot recall the statistics, but it was an increase of a few hours per kid uh, daily of exposure to tablets and phones, if I recall correctly, at the beginning of, of the um, pandemic. And we had some statistics maybe shared by the Environmental Health Trust, I cannot recall. But uh, for sure, if I look at the average citizen out there, what do kids uh, do at home if they're stuck with their parents <laughs> and their nine-year-old? They're on a tablet, they're glued there, and that's true for most kids. And that's just the unfortunate mess that we're in on a technological abuse standpoint, really. But yeah, I agree with you 100% that uh, there's it needs to be investigated much closer. And the more and more I go on, on podcasts and talk about uh, reducing exposure, more people come back to me and say, well, I was kind of doubtful about what you said. I thought maybe uh, it's not serious and I, I don't think I'm affected by wireless, but they merely turn off their phone at night and they sleep better and they see it night and day. So right there, it shows you that sometimes you're so you, you have that masking effect from that overexposure. And when you start reducing exposure, then you see almost uh, nearly me medical uh, miracles sometimes. Uh, Dr. Victoria Dunkley, for example, who's a psychiatrist, uh, wrote the book, uh, Reset Your Child's Brain. She sees nothing short of miracle for when she puts kids with ADHD, uh, violent behavior, uh, still wetting their beds when they're uh, a little bit uh, way, way uh, in, in their old age or, or, or teenage years and all sorts of symptoms that are including uh, the autism spectrum and 30 days of no screen, including no blue light and no EMFs, right? In the, in, in the, the entire experiment, it, it encompasses that. She sees conditions vanish. And she's highly esteemed and published. So it makes me think that a lot of people don't realize that a lot of their everyday ailments or what they consider being caused by bad luck are caused really by wireless devices or at least exacerbated by them. Absolutely. And one thing that I've been also looking at is the influence of these, the exposure to these devices on our energy field, our bio mm. field. Now, those who are truly electrosensitive and diagnosed as having really being dysfunctional around wireless really show distortions in the biofield. Uh, the biofield left right um, symmetry is gone. The um, energy field shrinks dramatically and um, it's clear. There are, uh, then there are those who say, I'm not electrosensitive. I can be around this stuff all day, but they show it in the biofield also. Really? Yes, it shows up um, as also some left-right distortion and also a good deal of stress. Instead of a smooth um, cocoon of light emitted from the biofield, we see very spiky, disturbed looking biofield. Can, That's can a sign we, of stress. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can we define the terms here? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a beginner to be perfectly honest when it comes to the biofield. What are we measuring and what exactly do you mean when you mean biofield and what maybe what instrumentation are you using to see the biofield is it biophotons is it a magnetic field just so we know what we're talking about well in this case i'm talking about an induced light emission from the fingertips okay uh, a device from russia which is called biowell Mm -hmm. B-I-O-W-E-L-L, biowell.com. It's a commercial device. I have a number of devices in my laboratory. I, we also count biophotons. We also measure uh, acupuncture meridian conductivity from the key points uh, around the body. So I've seen changes in all of those measures, but it's very convenient to use this commercial device because it's a quick uh, software analysis. And to look at a large number of people before and after exposure and to see how the biofield changes just after 10 minutes of exposure to, to, from people who say, I have no problem using the cell phone for 10 minutes to the head or, or working in the text, but it shows up in the energy field uh, using BioWell 
the Russian instrument, which assesses uh, the induced light emission from the fingertips. It's a system similar to curling in photography, but the Russians have related the fingertip emissions to all of the organs and tissues after many decades of work. So, so that we can look specifically at the brain, the heart and, and other organs and how they're impacted by exposure to this radiation. So I can make a more detailed analysis, but in general, uh, everyone's biofield is impacted. Even those who say, I don't have a problem, which mm. means really we're all energy beings. It doesn't surprise me. We're, we're analog energy beings in an increasingly digital world of technology, which, which is really totally incompatible with our true nature. We're used to, we're emitting analog waves from our brains and hearts, but now we're exposed to these millisecond or picosecond uh, pulses from digitized waves that go into the regions of the spectrum that are not part of nature, that are in the United States about 100 trillion times over our natural background. That's what we allow in terms of the guidelines for exposure, the FCC. And 100 trillion times above the natural background is simply nothing we can ever adapt to, especially when it's digitally pulsing on and off as ones and zeros of a computer uh, uh, link of digits. And so that's really what it means to be an analog being in a digital world of pulsing waves in a region of the spectrum that was never meant for our exposure. Yeah, I agree 100%. And it, it it goes back to me to uh, Robert O'Becker's work around uh, his book, The Body Electric, and, and so many other researchers. It's just one that comes top of mind for me. But uh, the fact that we are bioelectrical beings with sensors, with uh, electricity flowing through the body, through the cell membrane, in the mitochondria, magnetic fields emitted by the brain, magnetic fields emitted by the heart, magnetic fields or photons emitted by cells. We have cell-to-cell -cell communications. I see all these points of data in the medical literature and, and, and on PubMed, and I get fascinated by it saying, oh my God, it's so complex. And there are so many interactions, so many fields and so many uses of, of EMFs and other things to communicate within the body. And then somehow, <laughs> somehow telecom engineers say, oh, well, th there's no interaction between our machines and the human machine, bioelectric machine. So, and that's ludicrous. To of me. course. Well, they use this plastic mannequin <laughs> and they put a thermometer in there with some salt water. And they say, if there's no heating from strapping the cell phone on this mannequin, <laughs> then there's no biological effect. Well, it doesn't consider the fact that we have our own natural frequencies and resonances and we're driven by external modes imposed on us and that's the real danger is the modulation and mm -hmm. the pulsation of these waves and the engineers aren't talking about that they're just talking about um power peak power density or average power density but that has no relationship to the wave train the actual signal to which we are uh experiencing and uh somehow this has not permeated engineering for whatever reason but they're actually more concerned about the crosstalk of the Internet of Things than yeah. they are about the health effects that may result from our exposure to these things, especially over time. And once yeah. we change the infrastructure to the wireless 5G world of thousands of antennas or millions of antennas and thousands of satellites, I don't see any way to go back. Um, yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't make any sense without an environmental assessment and a moratorium on this kind of infrastructure to really understand it fully, to understand the health impact on humans and the biosphere. We have to be concerned about the pollinators because they're also impacted by millimeter waves. Those little hairs on the bodies of insects are about that size, millimeters, and, and they will be responsive to those. And in addition to agrochemicals, which have already uh, destroyed a lot of colonies of bees um, and other pollinators. So 
we have to be concerned about the entire biosphere, not just humanity. And we do not understand the impact. But one breath of fresh air on this whole thing was an important legal case here in the United States that happened August 2021. And it was a case by Children's Health Defense and the Environmental Health Trust. Yes. And they actually won this case, uh, pointing out that the FCC, sticking to its old guidelines of 1996, must move on, must start reviewing the literature and reconsider um, the impact of um, wireless over the last 25 years of research. Now, I don't know the, um, the outcome of that lawsuit, but it's probably still in progress. What does the FCC really have to do now? You know, we don't have a worldwide safety code. Um, there's all kinds of guidelines here and there, different countries have adopted. And Canada and the US have among the highest guidelines of exposure. Yeah. Other countries, Russia, Eastern Europe, China, India, are orders of magnitude lower. So, you know, they're taking into account these non-thermal effects, the non-heating effects, all the effects on DNA and on the nervous system, on the innumerable cellular delicacies that revolve around electromagnetism and how they're impacted. And they are considering that, whereas our countries are not. And that's simply mm -hmm. unreasonable in a day where we're in a time where we now have 25 more years of research. But we do need more research on real world devices. People can't just take single frequencies from a signal generator in the laboratory and say, oh, here's the result of this frequency band on this animal, because it's no longer relevant. We don't live in a world like that. We live in a world where we have multiple bands from 3G, 4G, and 5G, and it's just getting broader and broader, the exposure to microwaves, including millimeter waves, and the new pulsations, and the new way of delivering with um, phased array antennas, which will be much more uh, severe beams of radiation. So we have a lot more that needs to be studied before we can say, yes, this is safe. Yeah, and I, the way that Joel Moskowitz, uh, PhD, put it in, um, in his uh, opinion piece in Scientific, um, Scientific American, if I recall correctly, uh, he said, there's no reason to think that 5G is safe. And that's exactly well put. It's, well, previous technologies were proven harmful, and that's still debated when it should not. 2G, 3G, and the, the NTP study was 2G and 3G. So the results come uh, in, in 2019, 2018 and 19, and their final shows clear, clear um, carcinogenicity in um, in some cancer types like uh, like the um, um, the myelin sheet, uh, so the uh, I I'm just losing my 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 terms here. I, I don't recall the exact tumor type. Uh, schwannomas, exactly schwannomas. So uh, cancer of the myelin sheet and also uh, adrenal glands. So you see that in in rats and mice in the NTP study, which was really the largest study that had been done in the last decades. And then it's pretty much radio silence, but this was 2G and 3G. When I tell that to the average podcast host or the average citizen that I meet or mom or dad, they're clueless and they're speechless. They say, oh my God, well, that was 2G and 3G. We don't even use it anymore. There's barely anyone using the 3G networks anymore. Uh, most of them are 4G LTE and now 5G. So by the time we come up with 6G and 7G, we're going to still be studying 4G. So there's a big problem. That's why I think the only sane thing is exactly what you've said, the moratorium, stopping there our increase in exposure and controlling industry. But that's saying no to an industry that wants the next few trillions in profit. So I don't know how we get, get out of that, but for sure, it's um, getting the word out and continuing to, to do what, what you've been doing, Dr. Rubik, which is very courageous frontier science and not being afraid, I guess, of standing your ground and just keep on publishing. I, I don't know what else we can do. Well, I, th I think there's another thing people can do, because sure. one of the things I find is that the greatest exposure is usually within our homes 
and immediate workplaces yes. and where we sleep, where we have our desk, et cetera. We need to be very conscious about all those wireless devices and how they're impacting us, including the wireless landline, the deck phone, which actually mm -hmm. is a more hazardous emitter even than a cell phone because it's constantly emitting from the base. Yes. People have all these things around them and the more money they get, it seems the more um, more wireless devices they purchase, thinking that they're at the cutting edge now and they're going to enjoy all this technology, but it really is not healthy. They need to uh, remove themselves from it and not sleep near things like a tablet. I, I have friends who wake up to the alarm on their tablets, wireless tablets right next to the bed. Not sensible. Ditto for a cell phone right next to the bed. I use an old alarm clock with a battery. I don't even want the 60 hertz problem in my room. I want clean sleep. And I've known the difference because when I go to a hotel, I have to unplug those clocks in order to, to sleep appropriately. I know the difference. So we need to take stock of our own immediate environments with um, the various devices that we use. We can also turn the whole thing off overnight. We can have a... Um, a timer on your on your Wi-Fi router if you choose to use Wi-Fi and make it go off at night. How simple is that for a, a twenty dollars that you can buy in a hardware store? So there's so many things that you can do for yourself, even if you can't control the placement of antennas and satellites up there. So I say let's empower everyone to uh, choose wired over wireless whenever possible. We want wires should be our mandate. Yeah. We should get fiber optics to the premises. We've already paid for it in many cases and demand it. We do not want wireless coming from an antenna as the final step into our homes. Yeah, I agree 100%. This is, this is great. This is exactly what I've been repeating and I'm not inventing anything. I'm just repeating what scientists have been telling me about the topic, exactly what you've said. All the scientists that I've spoken to, Professor Holly Johansson and so many others have just said, you know, while we're trying our best to sort this out, you can reduce exposure and you can, you can do your best to minimize exposure. And a lot of people who do just start feeling better and those who don't start feeling better because maybe you've been feeling great before and you still feel great you're still doing something good for your health it's like saying should you avoid arsenic in your fruit juice which we know is often laden with arsenic or heavy metals in protein powder and so many other topics i've been studying in my nutrition years well yes you should even if you feel good it doesn't mean you should have more heavy metals in your food so minimizing all these agents will just make you lead a healthier life. And most people are not in the spot with their health where they feel that they are in the best health possible. And it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to stay healthy, considering all the factors we talked about, including electropollution. So right. I appreciate uh, your words so much, Dr. Rubik. I just wanted to know, maybe as closing words, uh, how can people follow your research and what are you working on at the moment? And uh, how can people support you in what you do? Well, I've got a few projects going on right now. And yes, I'm a nonprofit 501c3 and in the United States, people get tax deductions for supporting nonprofit labs such as mine. Um, one of the things we're trying to develop is a 5G meter for the people because oh, everything above this. eight gigahertz, you cannot pick up with any existing uh, common tri-field meter. Um, so unfortunately, we won't be able to measure it. The existing equipment is engineering grade and costs thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of dollars uh, and requires even a PhD to figure out how to run them. <laughs> so <laughs> good luck trying to measure your new 5G. Um, but we're working on a 5G meter and we could use funding to assist in that. Another thing that I'm doing is uh, looking for protective means. So far, I haven't found anything that helps protect people 100%. But there are products out there that have to do with strengthening the human energy field, a lot of them, that will help you resist these, the push and pull of these digital frequencies. So that's a strategy that I'm also working on. 
And we'll be testing a lot of things, plus developing some of our own. And a third project that we have really on the back burner, but I think is very important, is to develop a white zone. What do I mean by that? Mm. I mean a place where there's no wireless, except maybe infrared, uh, infrared communication between devices, which would be safe, but no microwave radiation, no millimeter wave radiation. And that would be totally safe. And for this, we need a substantial amount of money. We're looking for investors as well as philanthropists because we need a hunk of land, say on the order of a thousand acres and in a favorable environment, not necessarily California, but another state where things are, uh, I would say more open to this sort of thing, where we can build a community that uh, and, and, and a hotel for people who are electrosensitive to bring them in and really help them see what a difference it makes when they take themselves out of a wireless environment. So we call it the White Zone Project. And once again, I'd be happy to discuss this with anybody who's interested in investing or donating money towards this project. I have a couple of websites, although they're not up to date. One is brubik.com. Mm -hmm. B-R-U-B-I-K dot com. The other is FrontierSciences.org. Perfect. And I'm going to link all of this in the show notes or YouTube comment. If this stays on YouTube, I don't know, or BitChute or somewhere else, we're going to find a new platform anyway. I don't expect my longevity on YouTube to be very long. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I've made peace with that during the pandemic when I said, okay, I'm just going to talk about what I think is closest to the truth and stay open-minded. And if I get banned from certain platforms, we're going to move to other platforms. And so be it, because it's just the crazy, the craziness we're in. Uh, I'm very excited for one thing you mentioned in particular. All of these projects seem very, very exciting. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to come back on to speak specifically about EM, um, what I consider the EMF harmonizing devices or chips or pendants or pyramids, there's a lot of things we've been exploring. I've seen people tell me they make a lot of difference. I've personally chose not to endorse companies that are related to that type of device or harmonization because of the uncertainty that I personally have about these, which, which work, to what degree are they protective? And I have so many questions. So if you're willing, I'm just putting you on the spot, but if you're willing to come back a little bit later this year to talk specifically about that project, I would be so uh, grateful to talk to a scientist who's studying these things and trying to figure out what works. Yes, I, I would be happy to do that. Let me just say this now, because a lot of people think putting a little sticker on the backside of their phone makes it totally safe for them to talk like this. Yeah, yeah. And I say, well, show me what, where's the science? Where's the evidence that exactly. this makes it safe for you? And if they do not find a peer reviewed publication in which a number of people were studied, then I say uh, that science is inadequate. Mm -hmm. And very often, I have not seen adequate science for a lot of these products. I see a demonstration or a testimonial from a certain person. That's not enough for me. I want to see uh, real ben studies done with people and uh, with outcome measures that I understand, whether it's blood, biofield, acupuncture meridian, uh, conductivity, other measures that, that would show positive results, protective results. So that is very important. So meanwhile, buyer beware, because you're buying products that are uncertain and certainly don't protect you 100%. I have the only thing that might protect you 100% is really shielding. Mm -hmm. And you can get shielded clothing or shielded cases for your cell phone. Uh, but by and large, um, they will not work the same if you totally encase it in Faraday cage. You may as well just put it on airplane mode. Exactly. I agree a hundred percent. I'm so excited that we're, we're aligned on this. It's going to be a great discussion. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for all you do for uh, your willingness to, um, to just share about topics that are controversial. Uh, you, you are in full integrity. And unfortunately for a lot of people, I saw I don't know, this is personal to me. I saw fear take over a lot of people's uh, ability to stay in integrity. And I try to be compassionate, but I saw a lot of people crumble under the pressure, say, um, 
I, I, I cannot take all this pressure, society or peers or people ridiculing me and, and they, they stop or they kind of not talk about the topics that matter for that reason. But uh, you have that strength in you and talking to you has been uh, very nourishing and, and uh, inspiring for me. So thank you. Thank well, you it's sort of like I've done this so many years. I'm quite used to it. I feel like a duck in the water just rolls <laughs> off my back as the criticism comes. <laughs> exactly. And besides, I already have my peers that yes. uh, I've worked with over decades. So uh, life gets better uh, for people like me who dare to question beyond mainstream science. It's been a very worthwhile journey for me, and I have stuck true to my principles, and which is very important to me. That's tremendous. So please, uh, if people want to directly support your work, is, that, uh, is there a specific link where we can send people? It's always something I invite uh, nonprofits to do if uh, we have conversations such as these. We, we do have a donate button at okay. Uh, www.frontiersciences.org. Okay. Yes, we do. Or they could email Perfect. me, and it doesn't have to be through PayPal or one of those things. It can be a check or any other uh, way, crypto, whatever you wish. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank Send you crypto. very much. <laughs> sure. We would appreciate your support because, uh, you know, we don't get support from the government or big business. Yeah. We depend upon. Uh, the small philanthropist and donor and and now investor to move forward with us with this bigger project on the white zone. This is tremendous. So we're going to have that in the show notes with the episode everywhere where you can find this episode. You're going to find the link uh, frontiersciences.org and you can donate to uh, Dr. Rubik and her team. I'm sure you're not working alone, are you? No, no. Probably no. several people <laughs> working with you, right? So it's yes. a big team. I'm sure it costs a lot of money to run your own science. At the same time, it did. My my impression is, isn't that how science is supposed to be done in a very independent manner? And I wish that every scientist with ideas that are completely independent from the dogma would be able to have a lab and and be suffi sufficiently funded. Um, so I, I, I'm. I'm very excited that you're in this position where you can do science on your own terms, in a sense. Well, and that's how science was done before it became supported yeah. by big business or big yes. government and cahoots with big business. There were always were philanthropists who supported individual scientists who then were could be very creative and do their own thing. And I'm fortunate that I developed that life. But uh, it's not for everyone. I mean, some people just get caught into the system, unfortunately, which has become more and more and more restrictive for science, uh, towing the line in terms of big business interests. It's really been hijacked, in my yeah. opinion. I agree 100%. So thanks for being uh, one of the few remaining scientists on the bus of independent and truthful <laughs> science. Uh, that is not uh, influenced by um, some motive, money motive usually, and power. So thank you so much for being here. And I hope that we can uh, reconvene again and have another discussion about these EMF harmonizing devices a little bit uh, later uh, down the road. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubik. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.